So it is a great honor to, uh, to invite to our podium today uh, one of the most distinguished um, members of, of the Abu Dhabi community and the Emirates community at large, uh, and the name a person who is not certainly, I'm sure, not unfamiliar to all of you, uh, other than the ruling family, perhaps. He's one of the, the few names that uh, one is familiar with from, from a short visit or even a long visit to Abu Dhabi. His book, uh, From Rags to Riches, being so prevalent in the, for, for, for all the right reasons, in, in the um, hotel bookstores and all the other bookstores in town. And it really is a must-read for anybody who lives here or visits here. Um, His Excellency Mohammed A.J. Al-Fahim joined the family business after completing his studies in England in 1968, a critical period of transition in the Emirate of Abu Dhabi, which was then on the path to federation with the six other Emirates, shortly after the succession of Sheikh Zayed in 1966. With the aid of his late father, Mr. Abdul Jalil Al-Fahim, He helped to manage the development, growth, and diversification of the company into one of the largest family-owned companies in the Middle East. At present, the Fahim Group includes significant holdings in various private sector corporations, to wit real estate, hotels, automobile, travel, industrial, and oil field servicing, as well as advertising. Mr. Al-Fahim served as the first vice president of the Abu Dhabi Chamber of Commerce and Industry, he has also served on the board of the Telephone Company, I suppose that's before it is Salat, and the Council for Public Works. Currently, Mr. Fahim still sits on the boards of a number of organizations in the UAE, as well as serving as honorary chairman of the Al Fahim Group. Uh, Mr. A, a philanthropist at heart, he is the patron of the Future Center and the Special Care Center, both nonprofit organizations caring for children with special needs. Mr. Al-Fahim has been a keynote speaker at numerous conferences around the Gulf and particularly in the UAE. He has also spoken at a number of universities in the United States, sharing his experience of the extraordinary growth and progress of the UAE. He has lectured on diverse topics such as the challenges that face family businesses, issues of privatization, and the importance of well-developed human resources. An advocate for the conversion of robust family businesses into public companies, Mr. Al-Fahim has set one of the most significant precedents for this in the UAE, and in recognition for his signal and socially responsible entrepreneurial work, he was awarded the Chief Gulf, the Gulf Chief Executive Award in 1995 and the Arab Business Excellence Award in 2007. As one of the guardians of his country's history, he wrote, as I'm sure we all know, From Rags to Riches, A Story of Abu Dhabi, in English, first published in 1995. The book has subsequently been translated and published in Arabic, Japanese, French, Urdu, Russian, German, Italian, Azri, and Spanish. I always think of of it admiringly as, as the polyglot book, because every time I see a copy of it in English, I see copies of it in other languages. And the last time I read it, I tried a go in Italian, which was, which was a good translation. He has also written and published the Guide to Starting Business in the United Arab Emirates, which has, been, which has appeared in English and Arabic editions. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome His, Excell- His Excellency Mohammed Al Fahim to the podium. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's always a pleasure to talk to enthusiastic audience such as yourself because history is where we learn our future from. A lot of skeptics talk about, tell me, why do you write about history? Why do you talk about history? And I say because I want to learn the mistakes of others so I don't repeat them today or in the future. Unfortunately, including my own children, who hardly read a history book, I hope one day they will uh, learn to read books instead of uh, 
taking just a snapshot from their iPhones. <laughs> I, uh, I have to move from the podium because, as usual, I'm not that short, but it's the podium that is much too. <laughs> <laughs> You know, for a lot of you who came to Abu Dhabi in the last five years, 10 years, you found Abu Dhabi a developed country, a town with a lot of infrastructure, comfortable homes, schools, hospitals. And if you come, if you had come in the last two years and you come to this university, it's astonishing. I'm actually feeling so jealous that I've never had such an opportunity or part of this opportunity during the time I was growing up. Because Abu Dhabi was, as you will see in, in a minute, a completely different world in those days when I was growing up. And uh, I will start with how it looked in those days. OK. Now, this is Abu Dhabi as it was before Sheikh Zayed. You can say it's 1940, 1945, or 1950, or 1960, before Sheikh Zayed. Sheikh Zayed took over in 1966. So Abu Dhabi was like this, no change. The ruler's palace here, al Hassan, And the whole area from this coast, from this beach, all the way to here, if you draw a line from here to there, it's the Sheikh Hamdan Street here. So you, the whole of Abu Dhabi, was sandwiched between Sheikh Hamdan Street and the Cornish. And the population of Abu Dhabi in those days was approximately 1,800 inhabitants, men, women, children, everybody. And this is the Hassan taken from where Marx and Spencer shop today. <laughs> You know, women know where it is. <laughs> and men hate where it is. <laughs> and this is the homes, in our homes in Al Ain. Because Al Ain at the time was a place, our summer residence. Most of the families would go to Al Ain spend three months in Al Ain and live in these houses. A lot of you go on holidays to the Bahamas, to the uh, Caribbeans, to different countries and different resorts. And you see these huts on the beach with the uh, barasti on top or the palm leaves or whatever uh, shades they make. Those were for your comfort and holiday making. We were not holidaying in those days. We lived permanently in these houses. So good and bad, that's where we lived. And this is the profession and career of people. This is taken from the Batin area. We had two types of people who lived on the beach or on the seaside were fishermen and traders. And those who lived in the desert, Bedouin and camel and animal breeders. This is again Batin. And this is where uh, today the uh, Corniche, uh, at one time they used to have a clock tower and this is exactly the location where the clock tower used to be. But now it's next to the Chamber of Commerce of Abu Dhabi. If you pass on the Corniche, you will see the Chamber of Commerce. And this is exactly the location. And this is where 
people brought their catch from fi fishery catch and uh, pearls, and uh, usually met by the traders on the beach and bought and sold then and there. These are the type, these are the families waiting for their loved ones coming back from their pearl diving. At the time, we had no water, fresh water. We had no streets, no infrastructure, no lights, and of course, no cars. Though the few cars that were brought in after 1950 were mostly either the uh, oil companies who were exploring for the uh, oil around the uh, Abu Dhabi area, or few of the sheikhs, three or four cars. But the inhabitants or the locals did not have any cars. These are the Bedouins living in their own world. And this is a modern Bedouin having his camels next to his home in Abu Dhabi. And this is a photo that changed our life, or supposed to have changed our life, but it didn't. After this photo was taken, it went on for, an, for at least eight years before anything changed in Abu Dhabi, because uh, the revenue of the oil that came during when this photo was taken was not utilized or spent in Abu Dhabi for eight years. And uh, the, as you know, you probably know by now that uh, we, as a business family, we have the Mercedes uh, distribution, distribution uh, rights in Abu Dhabi. We have the Jeep. And uh, my father started it in 1964. And then I took over in 1969. And uh, my father rejoined Sheikh Zayed as his right-hand man. <coughs> and uh, as it happened before 64, this is the Mercedes that my father used. <laughs> and this is his camel, and this, he's riding on it. So he is no, he is no better than anybody else. He was just a regular guy on a camel in those days. And Sheikh Zayed was originally a Bedouin. He lived in Al Ain and the area around Al Ain. All he did in those days is keep people together, or keep the tribes together. It wasn't an easy job, because he, was, he didn't have the means to pay them or to spend to keep them together, except his own goodwill. He traveled among them, he lived like them, and he actually married into the tribes in order to keep a relationship with the people in order to keep peace between them. As you know from history, what tribes do is invade each other. And all they are interested in is stealing each other's camel. And they had not, no other wealth to steal, so they stole the camels instead. So Sheikh Zayed kept that peace in the area of Alain and the Western region. And this is one of his uh, hunting trip, that's my father with him. My father joined Sheikh Zayed uh, as early as 1943, and he stayed with him ever since until he passed away. And this is my famous photograph that was taken by an oil company photographer who visited Abu Dhabi in those days. And uh, I didn't know it existed until I was presented with it, presented with it. And it's very historical because, first of all, as you can see, all the kids in the photographs were shoeless. And of course, scruffy, 
and uh, looking as if they come from Mars. <laughs> the only good thing about them, about these kids, is that I happen to, meet, to be among them, <laughs> and I'm the best looking one. I, you can guess which one, because uh, being the best looking one, I'm the, the one not only who, have, who is shoeless, I, I was toothless too. <laughs> I'm the one in the front, right in the front here. <laughs> Sorry, where is it? Okay, that's it. <laughs> so now you know why I'm jealous and envious of the students in this university because that's when I started my school and that's how I looked during those days and there was hardly a school for me to go to except the Quranic school with the teacher, with the uh, Darwish Karam, our t first teacher. And the interesting thing, if you looked at this photograph and you say to yourself, what could these kids do in their life when they grow up? Well, I give you an answer because when our first teacher came to Abu Dhabi and asked us, what are you going to be? What is your expectation? 60% of us, we were only 65 children, by the way, in the school, 65% said we want to become drivers. We thought that was a grand job. That was a fantastic job to be a driver. Drive what? We don't know. Sometime cars in the future. <laughs> but we wanted to be drivers. The rest, 35%, said we want to become clerks. And God gave us according to our wishes. We grew up to drive cars. But in the meantime, we did a lot of other things. Because if you see some of my friends here, this is my friend Muhammad Fahad al Dahim. He grew up to become our first ambassador to Pakistan, then uh, Morocco, then he went to Italy, and he was our ambassador in Italy and the whole of the Balkan states. My friend Muhammad Darwish Karam, whose father he was teaching us the Quran, he was our first ambassador to Spain, and then he moved on to Tokyo, and he stayed for two years in Tokyo, then decided he didn't like the sushi and came back. <laughs> now he lives in Morocco. Uh, th this guy uh, here, Saeed, Saeed uh, Atij, who happens to be, I mean, he was uh, hopeless at school, even in reading Quran. <laughs> he became the first local pilot in Abu Dhabi, piloting the cargo ships into the Abu Dhabi port. I mean, I can't think of him as a pilot because I've seen what he looked like in his. <laughs> How could he become a pilot? I couldn't understand. He must have, maybe he is a, he's possessed <laughs> or something. <laughs> and this guy here, Saeed Atig, my neighbor, my friend, he became the undersecretary for water and electricity. And in those days, if you do not know Saeed Atig, then you are housed or building cannot be connected with water and electricity because you have to have his signature first. <laughs> How did they do it? I don't know. And this is the school, or the first school, which was called the Falahi School, which was next to the British Embassy today. Now in its place, a huge high-rise building, in those days, it was a school built by the British, donated to the ruler, who accepted it, but would not pay for the salaries of these teachers 
or buy us textbooks. So we had to buy the textbooks from the souk, if they, which did, did not exist, and bring our own water to school because there was no water in the school. And as, as you can see, we are still the same children, but now we wear, we wear a school uniform and shoeless still. <laughs> this is the school from the front. This is our playground. And I tell you, being shoeless in those days, we had a reason. Mainly because, as you can see, so much sand. Every time we wear shoes, it gets stuck in the sand. We had to carry them. So what's the point of having to carry, carry our shoes? So we decided not to wear them in the first place. And I have uh, one friend here that I would like to point out, this guy. Uh, he, he became actually your closest friend because he is so close to you that you always keep in, in your, uh, next to your heart because he's the guy who became the chairman of the central bank and signed on all the bank notes that you keep in your wallets. <laughs> in those days, he was shoeless like the rest of us. <laughs> and this is exactly the same, the same kids that's me here, and uh, Khalil, Fuladi, and Yusuf, most of my friends you, you saw in the first photograph. The surprising thing, and the wonderful thing, is that they became businessmen, ambassadors, ministers, and unfortunately, until they, they were at least in their uh, teenage, didn't really go to a proper school. And yet when they did, they worked hard enough to achieve that uh, position of trust. That's my father's first business with his bank manager who, who happened to be living on top of, of the shop, the manager, the bank manager on top, my father's shop underneath. And every time my father needed money for Sheikh Zayed, he knocks on the <laughs> on the door of the bank manager, please give us money. And this is a shop owner in Abu Dhabi. Uh, Abu Dhabi and Al Ain in the 60s or the 50s and the 60s were actually not a permanent residence for everybody. Uh, people used to come to Abu Dhabi during the winter and, and leave in the summer. So the shop owners or the businesses uh, traders or the fishermen would have another house in Al Ain or in Liwa. And this guy from Liwa owns a shop in Abu Dhabi and he's a Bedouin. And however, he, he keeps, okay. He keeps his gun next to him because at any time, he will, he is actually one of Sheikh's Shakbut's men, at any time, Shakbut will call his men, and uh, he has to close his shop, go and uh, be a Bedouin again. And this is a shop owner in Abu Dhabi. And this is, happened to be the, the gentleman, the man who changed our lives. I showed you our life before his time, and how meager it was, how down to earth, how uh, much lacking in infrastructure, water, shoes, everything. He came, he's a Bedouin, he's a man of vision. He was living the way, the same way we were living, the rest of us in Abu Dhabi. By the way, he didn't have a house in Abu Dhabi, he used to live in one room in the Hassan in the palace, and uh, he was a very down-to-earth uh, sheikh. But he was in love with his people, with his country, and he devoted his time to building his country and educating his chil the, chil the uh, people and the children. And he started with us. This is his first year in Abu Dhabi, 
when he, after he became the ruler. And for, the, for you guys who are in higher colleges of education, uh, the, the boy sitting here is Hamdan bin Mubarak. He's the minister of uh, higher education. Thank God he was wearing a shoes. <laughs> and this is the first airport in Abu Dhabi, a Sabha. It is situated now where the Abu Dhabi television and media today. And this is, used to be the airport. Uh, the plane would stop coming every time the uh, it rains in Abu Dhabi because uh, the Sabha used to get flooded. And this is the first sign of movement when BP came to Abu Dhabi, brought in petrol, oil, and lubricants for the oil companies, cars, and trucks. Because after they have found the oil in Abu Dhabi, they needed trucks and cars, and nobody can supply them in locally. So the BP was uh, there to help. And these are the same students, same children you saw in the first photograph. But this time, they are looking cleaner. <laughs> and wearing shoes. Uh, this, is, this is the same kids I showed you earlier. This is Muhammad Fahad, who became our, uh, his last post was in Italy, our ambassador to Italy. This is myself here. And this is Muhammad Darwish Karam. Funny enough, he st stands right at the back behind me in every photograph. <laughs> and there is a 10 years, 10 years apart and uh, my brother, he became the commander of the Air Force in Abu Dhabi uh, the, the, uh, air, when it started in Abu Dhabi. Jum'a Khalifa, he became the uh, naval commander in Abu Dhabi. Now, this is the time when Sheikh Zayed actually lumped us together, picked us up, and sent us all to England to be educated. And he told us, go and don't come back until you are grown up and you are men and educated to help your country. And that's what we did. We went to England, started learning English first, and then went to different uh, schools. Some of us completed their studies, and some of us moved on to universities in America and other countries to finish their uh, uh, university. This is, by the way, the first time, the first day we landed in, in my, my brother and I in, uh, in London. And the lady was taking us by train to Western Supermare in Somerset to stay with the family for the first time outside Abu Dhabi. And you can imagine our disbelief to leave Abu Dhabi, a fishing village, with no infrastructure and land in London. We thought we, we, we landed in a different uh, zone or uh, space, because there we saw buses, cars, trains. You can see the train behind us. We were scared of it, too. The first time we go on a train, but it was something new, and we were determined to make something of our lives. And this is how Sheikh Zayed started. In the evenings, he would sit with the town planner and uh, look over their plans and uh, maps. And in the morning, because Sheikh Zayed could not read himself, he did not believe in reports and written reports from his uh, staff. He wanted to see everything done himself. So he moved around, checked every single project that 
the municipality worked on or the of the or the labor or the works department are working on he checked them personally every day he would go from seven o'clock all day long going for, from one location to another checking these projects and giving instruction making uh, changes this is one of his tour uh, around my father next to him. And this is uh, inspecting some of the uh, houses being built. And these are some of the men who actually in Sheikh Zayed entrusted with the affairs of the people. Sheikh Zayed was a very busy man, as you can imagine. He has to build a country. At the same time, think about the future federation of the country. So these are independent businessmen and uh, local uh, dignitaries who were asked to participate in the development. So he formed a counc councils, water and electricity council, in which I am a member, and then municipality council, planning council, and some of the educated uh, low, uh, members of the community were uh, members of the, these councils who helped him to actually develop the country. And he relied on them, and they were not paid a salary or rem given any remuneration. And uh, just to introduce one or two of them, this is uh, Ahmed Masoud. He's, not, he's the uh, distributor for the Nissan and uh, Datsun cars in Abu Dhabi. He's a businessman, and he started his uh, business after Sheikh Zayed became the ruler. Next to him, uh, Hamil al Ghaith. He was a businessman. He, he, was the, he's the, he was the chairman of the uh, Al Ain Insurance Company. And the stock market today is in his building. If you go to this local stock market, this is where his building is. And my father, uh, Yusuf Saig, uh, the director of municipality uh, from Sudan, and uh, Thani bin Marshad and Rashid bin Awaidah, all of them businessmen who uh, were uh, helping de to develop the country at the same time gener um, expanding their businesses in Abu Dhabi. And some of the same dignitaries, Al Utaiba, who who, the middle gentleman here. He became the undersecretary of the municipality, and he was entrusted by Sheikh Zayed of distributing free land to the Abu Dhabian. And that is, by the way, Sheikh Zayed gave us, as locals, four pieces of land. One to build a house on, one to build a commercial building, a third one to, in the industrial area, and a fourth one as a farm. And each Abu Dhabian got four pieces of land. On top of this, he built homes, what those days we used to call them local, home, local houses. He built homes and gave them free to the population with no charge whatsoever. And not only free, he, he gave them free water and free, free electricity as well. This is mainly to compensate the people for what they have lost before his rule. They lived hundreds of years in poverty, and he wanted to compensate, make it up for them. And that's what he did, by giving us free land, free buildings, and free homes. Uh, in addition to his, to Sheikh Zayed being 
the ruler and the planner and the developer of Abu Dhabi and the political head. He was a very sociable person. He would come to our homes. He would attend our marriages, our weddings, our uh, celebration. And this is one of his visit to a local club, which I happen to be the chairman at the time, uh, celebrating his accession day, his second accession day in Abu Dhabi. And this is, sit he is sitting with us. And if you see the smiling gentleman behind Sheikh Zayed here, Uh, he's an Egyptian uh, football player who were visiting Abu Dhabi in the, for the first time in 1969. Nobody visited us before except from 69. They wanted to see what is this Abu Dhabi and what is Sheikh Zayed. So a lot of people came. And this was a sport team came. And we happened to have a, a local singer who that evening decided to sing a song of Umm Kulthum, the famous Arabic singer. And of course, the Egyptians were so astonished that somebody from this area knows Umm Kulthum. They were shouting and screaming. And of course, Sheikh Zayed was very, uh, very uh, pleased with that. And this is the result of his work worked 20 hours a day, planning, building, developing, spending. He had, he had no concept of money. Money to him was means of achieving something. And that's what he did. He spent money without regard to the amount as long as that amount, that money went for the use and the improvement of the, his people. And this is his uh, achievement. On top of his achievement as a, a ruler of Abu Dhabi, he was working for the federation. He, was, he wanted to federate the country. He wanted to establish the union in the, the Emirate Union. And if anyone tells you it was simple and easy for him to achieve that goal, you can tell him a liar in his face. Because Sheikh Zayed spent four years trying to convince the Emirate rulers to join the federation. He used to go around every month, around them, talk to them, convince them, uh, uh, show them the, uh, the benefit of the Federation. And they were very resistant. They were not very helpful. And it took him three years to convince them. And, and the... Uh, let me say, some coaxing and threat and bribing to convince the rulers that this is the way forward and this is the way we should be. And that's why we needed the uh, federation. They couldn't see. They had no vision. They thought he, he was only trying to become the president. He, what they did not know, that Sheikh Zayed is actually working for them. He was trying to convince them to, fed, to federate in order to, to create a, a country out of, the fed, out of the emirate. It wasn't good for us to go, to go it on our own, as Abu Dhabi separately, Dubai, Fujairah. We were too small. I told you when, we, when he started, when he became the ruler of Abu Dhabi, our population is only 1,800. What, six, year, six years later, we were so what? We were 10,000? What is 10,000? Nothing. This university can house 10,000 today. So you can imagine 
what would become of us had he not sought in his wisdom to force himself on these rulers and make them join the federation. Thank God they had the wisdom and the sensibility to join and uh, a United Arab Emirate was formed. And this is the flag of the Emirate which flies today above all else all, all, all other flags in the Emirate. Now, he had to develop Abu Dhabi, educate the people, build the infrastructure, federate the Emiratis, but he was a family man. And he was a father above all. And this is the result of his hard work in the last four hours that he spent outside his majlis. <laughs> that these are the children of Sheikh Zayed, who are the, our rulers today, and they are administrating uh, the country in their father's footsteps. So you can see he's a very hardworking man. This is the last photo that was taken for him in our house. I told you, Sheikh Zayed, a very, Sheikh Zayed was a very down-to-earth person. He came to our homes for dinners, for lunches. And in fact, when he does not have any invitation from anybody, he would say in the majlis, what is it? Nobody wants to invite us for lunch or dinner. And people will jump and say, it's my turn today. And there he goes, and uh, he will join everybody, all the families in, the, in their homes. He was a father, a teacher, a ruler, a president of the United Arab Emirates, and uh, a gentleman. And this is, my friends, the part of our story in the, uh, in the book, because had I told you about every, everything, you would not buy it. <laughs> so I'll keep something in reserve for your own curiosity to buy the book. With this, I would like to thank you for being good listeners. And I thank you for uh, giving me the chance to talk to you today. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. It's nice to see you tonight. Thank you. Um, I'm a teacher with Attic, and I'm in the new school model where they teach science, math, and English. What do you think of that program being taught in English instead of in traditional Arabic? Well, when it, it was first thought about and it was discussed in the presence of His Highness Sheikh Nahyan, sometime 10, I think, or 12 years ago, a lot of people said, but why are we learning English, or learning, or going to schools and, learn, and speaking English rather than Arabic? He told them, because our future is not having to deal with ourselves locally. We are an international uh, people. We want to be, uh, we could mix easily with others internationally. We send our children to higher educations, to universities abroad. And if they don't have the English language as a first language, they will never succeed out there. And we try, they tried it before. They tried it from 1969 to 1980s or 90. It didn't, most of the students who, were, who went out there had to go through one year to two years just to learn English. So Arabic can be taught at home and partly at school. But English was a must because all the textbooks were 
written in English. And to translate everything would have been time consuming and difficult. So Sheikh Nahyan took that decision uh, against all odds and uh, implemented it in the schools. Thank you very much. Uh, I very much enjoyed reading your book. It's a fascinating story. I've only been living in Abu Dhabi since January and never had anything to do with the Middle East prior to that, so it answered a tremendous number of questions. And you and your countrymen are to be complimented for having accomplished so much. It's really an amazing story. But I'm also a banker who's focused on, um, uh, in the past, uh, financing countries, mostly Latin America and also Europe. And I wonder if you and your countrymen question the future and the economic model where, look around, uh, there are very few Emirati here, and so many people who aren't Emirati uh, benefit, and so much of the growth will be dependent on Emirati. So the question again is, do you question the economic model going forward? You know, we couldn't have built our own countries ourselves. We, don't have the, we didn't have the manpower, nor the resources, or the know-how. We had to invite people from abroad. To the extent today we are the minority in our own country. We are only 10% of the total population of uh, the emirate, while 90% expatriates, foreigners, visitors, and uh, intellectuals. We have never, from the beginning, we have never expected or even thought that we can do without the expatriate community who are helping us to develop our countries and to take us to the future. Because Sheikh Zayed, from the beginning, told us we are a host country, and we have to accept the foreigners as guests. And we must treat all those who come to our, who live and who come to our country and live with us as our guests and respect them so. A lot of people come to tell us today, but a lot of the money is transferred at the end of the month from the uh, emirate abroad to India, Pakistan, to different foreign countries, and this is the wealth of the country. To tell you the truth, this is their right. They, they come to the emirate, they work as uh, doctors, uh, technicians, engineers, uh, in 140 different jobs, and this is their right to transfer their, their money abroad. We have nothing against it. It's uh, their money. But what they leave behind is the infrastructure and the work they leave behind for the future, for the generation after us to take advantage of. So. The economy of this country, yes, it is based in the emirate, and it is partly transferred abroad, but that is life. We believe in the saying of live and let live. So we have nothing against the uh, expatriate or the uh, people living with us, working in different jobs, because they are our teachers. Without them, we would not be where we are today. What do you think of the, the pace of the emiratization program in the country? Well, we have to provide jobs to all our school kids. And we have to provide uh, income for the uh, professionals for the local uh, communities. So we try to encourage them to participate in the development and the uh, 
progress of their country. So no matter what we do, we are still going to be minorities in our country. We we'll still be uh, short in fulfilling the 100% uh, aim or uh, mark that outsiders expect us to do. And plus, we cannot actually uh, force every Emirati to take on a job if they have something else to do. We can only encourage them and show them the way if they want to. But most of them actually don't want to work for the government or they don't want to work for the uh, private sectors. And uh, a lot of them, for instance, prefer to work as uh, uh, private uh, businessmen or uh, intellectuals. So uh, we cannot do what the Omani has done. In Oman, they more or less succeeded to about 70%, 80%. But for us, if we can reach emiratization within the 25%, 30%, we will be very happy. Uh, can I ask, ask one final question as uh, some sort of grabbing the prerogative of having a mic? But uh, I'm, uh, I'm very interested in, in um, knowing that what you use as documentation or archives for the first part of the book, which is the history, whether it was based principally on, on, on just talking to your elders and your, or whether you actually did re research in, 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 in no, books I, and archives. I, I got a lot of uh, information from the British archive. I was very lucky to meet uh, uh, a lady from the, uh, working for the archive, and she helped me to get out everything that pertains to this area and to the history of uh, Abu Dhabi. Plus, I was very lucky to have, at that time, my uncles, my uh, uh, elders, most of those I showed their photographs were uh, pearl divers and uh, traders and seamen. So the, I asked them and they helped me to go through a lot of uh, details that I did not know. So both, uh, both areas I used. Thank you very much. So I, I think we should let you rest uh, after your... Um the work of having presented your book, but the work of having done this book, which is a fabulous book. I just want to add a comment or make a comment because I found tonight's talk incredibly eye-opening, even though I've read the book several times because of the combination of intimacy and the great significance of the arc you, you paint over the development of the country. And I found that in the book and it's, it, it's um, something quite impressive. So I thank you for, for that, for coming here. Um, and I hope you'll stay behind to answer perhaps a few questions after signing the books. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you.